Hello, my friends, and welcome back. Today, we're doing another social studies test. Okay, the social studies test that we're doing today will really prepare you for both the GED and the high set test. So, do make sure that you watch this entire video because you are committed to getting your GED or high set. It's going to take a little work, so watch the entire video here. Welcome to Purely Persistent. I'm Michelle. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so happy that you're here and ready to make this commitment in your life. And if you're returning, welcome back. And do share this video if you know anyone that is working on achieving their high school equivalency certificate. Now let's get started on the test. Now before we go any further, I want you to pause the video for just a minute and download the slides that go with this test, okay? By having the slides, you'll be able to see it a little bit better than you might be able to see here on your screen, and you'll be able to zoom in and out if necessary, and it's really just going to help you. So the link down below, I have free slides. Or the test that we're using here today comes from HiSET. It is the HiSET free practice test, their very first one. So it's a couple years old, but it's definitely relevant in preparing you for the test because the questions are still worded very similarly. And if you're taking the GED, it'll really help you guys out too. If you've watched any of my reading, science, or social studies videos before, you might remember that I have a specific way that I recommend taking the test. Okay, and it's following this specific technique. The first thing we're going to do is survey. So basically, take a quick look at maybe pictures or the first, I say like half a line of each paragraph. Look at the titles, that sort of thing to really grab your attention. The next thing we'll do is we'll take just a brief look at the questions. Now, the surveying and the questioning, I would take no more than 30 to 45 seconds total to do this because it is going to be a timed test. Then you're going to read, and as you're reading, you might be able to answer some of those questions, which makes it really handy, and then recite. So go back and make sure that you're answering the questions correctly. And then finally, we have review right? There's nothing worse than clicking the wrong answer when you knew the right answer, right? So that's what I like to take a little bit of time to do. Now, if you're taking a computerized test, it may be a little bit more challenging to look at the questions, but definitely survey and look at the questions if you're able to. Just don't take too much time doing those first two steps. Okay, so here's our first article. As I mentioned, I'm going to just survey. So I'm going to read like this first part right here, and then also just a little bit of each of the paragraphs, but not, not very much, like literally half a line, okay? So the title part says, the 1930s and 40s were turbulent years in the United States. This passage considers the impact of the Great Depression and Second World War on the United States economy. Okay, so now I'm going to read a, just about, like I said, half a line of each paragraph here, or of each first line. So during the administrations of Herbert Hoover and FDR, full recovery from this depression did not come until dire predictions about mass unemployment. So just by doing that, I have a general idea of what's going on. And now I'm going to take a quick look at the questions. Now these questions here, the way that the program set it up, they're not exactly in order, but uh, that's okay, right? Okay, so number three, the US economy during the Second World War could most accurately be described as, okay, second one here, which of the following would be the best example of the type of consumer goods that were on demand when the Second World War ended? According to the passage, which of the following was primarily responsible for the end of the Great Depression? Number five, according to the passage, the $800 increase in real income enjoyed by the average family between 1941 and 1946 was primarily the result of Seven, based on the information in the passage, it could be concluded that an important factor in the growth of the United States economy 
in the middle of the 20th century was, number six here, which of the following would be the best example of a technological miracle achieved during the Second World War? And finally, our last one here. Judging from the way GNP statistics are used in this passage, it can be concluded that one of the primary purposes of the GNP figure is to analyze. Okay, so now we're gonna take a little bit of time and read through the entire passage. And now that we've sort of reviewed the questions, we can sort of keep them in our brain as we are reading them. So if you haven't already downloaded the slides, do that so that you can go along with me and read these just a little bit better. During the administrations of Herbert Hoover and Franklin D. Roosevelt, poverty was widespread. The Great Depression had dealt a severe blow to the economic well-being of the nation. For example, the gross national product, GNP, the total value of all goods and services produced in a year, had dropped from $103 billion in 1929 to $55 billion in 1933. Pretty big, pretty big jump, right guys? Like half of the, the gross national product. Full recovery from this depression did not come until the Second World War, when United States industry went into high gear producing war materials. To enable the Allied armies to win the war in both Europe and the Pacific, technological miracles were achieved. Employment rose as factories worked around the clock. High wages and government controlled prices helped create a tremendous growth in family incomes. Because of the emphasis on production of heavy goods and machinery, much of the money people earned went into savings. Measured in dollars of constant purchasing power and what economists call real income, Average yearly take-home pay of families rose by about $800 from 1941 to 1946, an increase of about $160 per year. Okay, guys, think about that. So, I mean, this was 80 years ago, right? $160 a year 80 years ago? That could be worth like a couple thousand dollars, right? So it's a massive difference for these families. Dire predictions about mass unemployment after the war proved wrong. In the peacetime economy, industry flourished as price controls were removed and manufacturers scrambled to meet the huge demand for consumer goods. There were recessions during the 20 years after the war, but they were minor economic ripples compared with previous national depressions. Okay, so our question one here, according to the passage, which of the following was primarily responsible for the end of the Great Depression? So, federal anti-poverty programs. Hmm, it didn't talk at all about federal anti-poverty programs. However, programs like that were developed during this time frame. Okay, technological progress. Again, it didn't really talk about that so much. I mean, a little bit, but that wasn't really the emphasis, right? Government controls over prices and wages, it did mention that. However, that is not really the, the reason for the end of the Great Depression, right? So the development of the war economy, that's the answer because as the Great Depression was in full swing, they started to have a war and so the government and the people, the economy started to grow because they started producing products for the war. Number two, which of the following would be the best example of the type of consumer goods that were in demand when the Second World War ended? Okay, so keep in mind the Second World War ended around 1946. So keep keeping that in mind and notice here it says consumer goods. That's kind of a big deal right? That'll help us answer the question. So consumer goods are things that consumers can buy, right? So can they buy automobiles? Absolutely. And during that time, more and more people were buying automobiles, right? So better highways. Can you purchase better highways? Is that a consumer good? No. Commercial airplanes. 
Is that a consumer good? No, right? That is, you, you know, you could purchase a flight, but it's not something that you purchase and own yourself. Same thing with railroad passenger cars. It's not a consumer good per se. So the answer here is A, automobiles. Number three, the United States economy during the Second World War could most accurately be described as, and we have different types of economies. This is something that you're going to want to make sure that you understand, the different types of economies, okay? So a free market economy is basically what we have right now. So basically, everything within a free market economy is based on supply and demand, and there's no government control, okay? So there are a lot of different companies that are selling certain things, or maybe even the same thing, and then if it's in high demand, they will probably have more. If it's in less demand, maybe they won't, and that really impacts the prices, that sort of thing. A managed economy is where basically prices of things are managed and the supply and demand, I guess supply rather, is also going, going to be managed, okay? So for instance, in Greece, they say that bottled water can only be one euro. So if you buy a bottle of water, you won't be paying more than one euro, which is about uh, just a little over a dollar for those of us in the United States. Think about bottled water in the United States, right? Depending upon where you're getting it, it can be $1 or it can be $5, right? If you're buying a bottle of water at the airport or at a theme park, it's going to be really expensive, right? There's no managing at all. Okay, a barter economy is where someone gives, someone gives somebody something else in exchange, okay? So maybe you are a barber and I have a farm. I could say, I will give you two dozen eggs if you give me a haircut, right? So they're sort of bartering. They're not necessarily exchanging money for a good or a service. They're bartering on whatever, okay? And then a monopolistic economy. So think about the game Monopoly. The purpose of that game is to basically take control over all of the properties, right? And monopolies in the United States are actually illegal, okay? So you can't take complete control over one thing in the economy. So for instance, if I wanted to do online shopping and Amazon was the only thing, the only place where I could do online shopping, Amazon could really jack their prices up, right? They could do whatever they want. And so a monopoly where one company controls the market. So that being said, during the Second World War, what were we, right? We weren't a monopolistic economy, right? There wasn't really bartering. However, in a lot of countries there is bartering, it's kind of fun. Okay, free market economy like we have now, or was it a managed economy? Now, it was actually a managed economy and it indicated that in our, in our reading. So the answer here is B. Next one. Judging from the way GNP statistics are used in the passage, it can be concluded that one of the primary purposes of the GNP figures is to analyze, let's, let's reread it here, right? It says, for example, the gross national product, the total value of all goods and services produced in a year, had dropped from 103 billion to 55 billion. Okay, so again, it's the val total value of all of the goods and services produced in an entire year. So is that going to have anything to do with population trends? No, <laughs> right? Is that going to have anything to do with employment trends? Well, it could, whoops, <laughs> it could, but not, not necessarily, right? Economic trends, so the GNP is actually an indicator of the, econo of the economy, okay? So people that are studying economics, economists, they study the gross national product 
to figure out economic trends that, that are happening, okay? And D here says the effects of government regulations on business. Again, that really doesn't have anything to do with goods and services produced in a year. So our answer is C. Number five, according to the passage, the $800 increase in real income enjoyed by the average family between 1941 and 1946 was primarily the result of inflation? Mm, not so much. That's what we're dealing with right now. And I actually have an entire video based on inflation that really teaches you about inflation. So make sure that you watch that video. Okay, government subsidies. That's when the government gives you something. Maybe the government gives you money or maybe the government gives you food. They are subsidizing your life. Did they subsidize that $800? No. Did it have to do with the government decreasing taxes? No, the government did not decrease taxes. And finally, raising wages. Yes, it indicated that they were raising wages, right? And the government controlled prices. Again, that managed market with prices. So D is our answer. Number six, which of the following would be the best example of a technological miracle achieved during the Second World War? So guys, this is actually not included in the article. Okay, this is something that you need to sort of think about technology, miracle, and what do you know about that time frame? Okay, so number A or letter A, the use of advertising to sell huge numbers of war bonds. Does that have anything to do with technology? No. B, the development of a rationing system for distributing goods. Again, not really dealing with technology. C, the invention of radar. Hmm, definitely dealing with technology, right? D, the implementation of price controls. Again, not dealing with technology. So the only technological miracle that, are, that is offered here is C. So C is our answer. Number seven, based on the information in the passage, it could be concluded that an important factor in the growth of the United States economy in the middle of the 20th century was inflation. So inflation doesn't necessarily deal with growth per se. Again, that inflation video. B, the rise of consumer spending after the war. Yes, consumers started spending a lot more, right? Remember the automobiles? They definitely started spending a lot more money. And as they're spending more money, then that means the economy is going to increase, right? The economy is going to grow. Let's look at C, the change of ownership of many businesses. That doesn't really cause an economy to grow. That just really changes hands, right? D, the development of economic indicators such as GNP. So yes, those are really important because it's tracking the growth of the economy, but that is not an important factor, right? So the answer here is B. So we're about a third of the way through with this test. So I want you to give me a thumbs up if you're still here because you rock and you are sticking with it. Be sure to stick with it until the end so that you can really gain the most from this video and really do your best on that test. So here we have another article. Let's do a quick survey. Again, read the first half a line of each paragraph and then also read the titles. Under the provisions of section 14B of the Haft-Hartley Act, okay, now newspaper X, the union shop is necessary and just and should not be banned. Section 14B should also be repealed. The mass media have always been anti-labor. Newspaper Y. If workers cannot be barred from jobs because of race or religion, right to work laws do not give states unfair advantages, the right of states to forbid the union shop. Okay, so a general idea of what's going on. Definitely need to read it a bit more so that we really understand what they're talking about so we can better answer the questions. But the purpose again is just have a general overview of what's going on. 
So let's take a quick look at these questions here. Again, you want to do this very quickly and that's if you're able to, but definitely make sure that you survey before you read. Which of the following would have been the likely result of a repeal to section 14B? Now number nine down here on the bottom, the views expressed by newspaper X were probably similar to those of all right, number 12, it's a little small guys. Uh, newspaper Y considered the right to something laws to be similar to the intent of laws that. Number 13, at the time of the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, unions were exempt from some of the laws that regulated big businesses. Which two, two newspapers, okay. 11, newspaper Y apparently supported 10, which of the following did newspaper X claim as a disadvantage of open shops? So as you're reading through these and you're surveying, if it ever refers to a specific line in the paragraph, don't take the time to, to survey that, right? Save yourself two seconds and don't read that part, okay? But let's look at the questions. Rather, let's look at the paragraph and read the paragraph. Under the provision of Section 14B of the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, states were given the power to pass right-to-work laws restricting the union shop. A union shop is a workplace where all workers must belong to the union. Although organized labor worked to get Congress to repeal the section of the Act, by 2012 many states had passed such laws two points of view from the debate that followed the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act were presented below. So newspaper X. The union shop is necessary and just and should not be banned. Open shops create labor management friction that leads to dissatisfaction and wildcat strikes. Unions provide workers with a channel through which they can voice grievances and collectively bargain for wages, working conditions, and hours. Since union agreements generally apply to all workers, why should some get a free ride by receiving union benefits without paying union dues? Section 14B should also be repealed in the interest of regulating interstate commerce. No state should be allowed to enact laws that would give it a commercial advantage over another state. Why shouldn't government act to strengthen labor? It aids businesses by providing protective tariffs, subsidies, tax advantages, and research. The mass media have always been anti-labor. They have consistently failed to point out the per capita income in the right to work states is far below the national average. Newspaper Y. If workers cannot be barred from jobs because of race or religion, they should not be barred because they do not wish to join a union. Conscientious objectors are not forced into the army. Why should independent job holders be forced into unions? Right to work laws do not give states unfair advantages. Raw materials, transportation, and markets are of prime importance in attracting industries. The right of the states to forbid the union shop is a valuable check on the use of union power. We feel that instead of being allowed more freedom, unions should be subject to more government control. Now let's take a look at those questions. Number eight, which of the following would have been the likely result of the repeal of section 14B? So you have to know what the word repeal means, right? If you don't, you won't know what they're asking. Repeal means essentially to get rid of, okay? So let's review what section B, what section 14B means. And so right here in the first half of this top paragraph, it illustrates what it is. So starting in the middle of the first sentence here, states were given the right to pass work to write laws restricting the union shop. A union shop is a workplace where all workers must belong to the union. Section 14B says that we, that they can do it if, if they want to, right? So if we get rid of it, 
Would it improve labor management relations? No, right? Would it have anything to do, deal with strikes? Not really. Okay, now decrease or increase union power. So again, section 14B says they can, you know, they don't have to do it if they want to, if they don't want to, you don't have to join the union, right? But if they say, get rid of that, right, then would it decrease the union power or would it increase? It would increase the union power, right? Because if you're forcing everyone to join the union, then the union would, would be more powerful, right? Number nine, the views expressed by newspaper X were probably most similar to those of, okay, let's sort of review what the views by newspaper X were. So in this first sentence here, it says union shop is necessary and should not be banned. So remember a union shop as indicated in the first paragraph of this article is that everyone must belong to the union, right? So newspaper X is saying we must keep it and it should not be banned. And then it goes over the reasons why it's so important that everyone is in a union, right? So let's look at some of these options here with those statements in mind. So a lobbyist for a business organization. Now a lobbyist is someone that goes to Congress and speaks on behalf of a company, right? Now companies don't like unions, right? They don't want their employees to have a union because then the union is going to have a lot of control and power and make it so that the, the company has to give better wages or has to do everything that the union tells them to do. And if they don't, the, the workers might go on strike, right? So do you think that a lobbyist for a business is going to want it? No, they're, they're anti-union. Businesses are definitely not interested in unions. Same with B, the president of a large corporation. The president is not going to want the workers to unionize, right? Okay, an official of a large union. Now there we go, the official of the union. So the union might choose like a president, right? And the president wants the union just like newspaper X has, right? And the governor of a right to work state uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not, right? But the answer here is, is definitely C, the official of a, of a large union. Number 10, which of the following did newspaper X claim as a disadvantage of open shops? So uh, here it's actually in the second sen sentence, open shops create labor management friction that leads to dissatisfaction and wildcat strikes. Okay, so A, Workers were more likely to quit their jobs? No. B, strikes tended for a long duration? No. C, workers went on strike without warning? That's the answer. So a wildcat strike here is when they go on strike without warning, right? And then D, workers gave notice before going on strike. That, that would just be like a regular strike, right? Wildcat strike, we don't like this, let's go, let's stop working and go, go strike, right? Number 11, newspaper Y apparently supported, and the answer to that is actually in this last sentence or last paragraph right here. So the last paragraph says, the right of states to forbid the union shop is a valuable check on the use of union power. We feel that instead of being allowed more freedom, unions should be subject to more government control. So that's sort of what they're supporting, right? So. A says, barring non-union members from joining unions. They're not really into that, right? That's what newspaper X is more into, right? The abolition of labor unions. No, it doesn't say that they're anti-labor unions. It's, they're just not, they don't think people should have to be forced to join the union. The repeal of section 14B. No, right? They're, it was newspaper X that wanted to repeal it. And D, the limit, limiting the power of labor unions. Yeah, and that's, that's what they wanna do, right? It says that at, in that paragraph right there that they want to limit the power of the labor unions. 
Number 12. Newspaper Y considered the right to work laws to be similar in, it, in intent to laws that provide federal aid to education. Hmm, not really, it has nothing, no sort of similarities there. Regulate immigration, again, not, not really. Protect citizens' civil rights. Okay, so let's just think about it for a second. So, civil rights are, you should not be judged or discriminated based on the color of your skin, right? The right to work laws are essentially saying you should not be discriminated if you choose to work or if you choose to be a part of the union or not, right? And so, I mean, I guess that's like one aspect of the right to work laws. It's much, much deeper than that, as are the civil rights, right? So that's, that's the answer there because it's, you can't force someone based on, based on who they are, based on their beliefs, their looks, that sort of thing. And D, deal with nation's defense, not, not really. 13. At the time of the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, unions were exempt from some of the laws that regulated big businesses. Which of the two newspapers providing written editorials would probably have favored more regulations on unions? Now, we know just by reading this earlier that Newspaper Y definitely wants more regulations, right? It says right here, the last sentence, um, unions should be subject to more government control, aka more regulations. Now, Newspaper X, they're basically saying everyone should be forced into the union and then they we do whatever the union says. So that's not necessarily going to be unions should have regulations, right? They're like unions should not have regulations. We should be able to do whatever we want, right? So the answer there is B, newspaper Y thinks that there should be more regulations. I want you to take a little water break right now. And when you're testing, make sure that you have water with you because if your brain is dehydrated, your prefrontal cortex and really your whole brain does not work efficiently and therefore you will not do as well on the test as if you are hydrated. Now, when I say hydrate, I mean actually drink water. Don't drink coffee, don't drink energy drinks, pop, soda, stick with water, okay? Hydrate your brain so that you can do really well on your test. One of my favorite parts about the social studies test is the geography section. And so I love looking at maps. It's just really fun for me. So when you come upon a map or a diagram, definitely take a little bit of time and look through it and analyze it before you go to the questions. And then when you come to the questions, you'll be more likely to be able to answer the questions a little better. Okay, so here we have the earth, right? And it says wind patterns at the top. We have the North Pole and the South Pole. And in the middle right here is the equator. You can see here we have 30, 60, 90, and then going down as well. So those are the lines of latitude as it goes up and down. And we have our winds, right? It looks like the, the top, the prevailing westerlies and the bottom prevailing westerlies, those go from those go either north or south and up. And there we go, that's the, the wind patterns. And so when we answer the questions, because we took a minute to evaluate it, hopefully we'll do a little better. Number 14, wind patterns are determined primarily by areas of pressure. If winds tend to move from high pressure areas to low pressure areas, which of the following most likely describes the unusual pressure conditions at the South Pole and latitude 60 degrees south. So we're really just talking about these, this little section here, right? So it says again here, if winds tend to move from high pressure areas to low pressure, so looks like it's starting at the high pressure, so the South Pole is high pressure, and then it's moving north so it looks like here the pole is the higher pressure and then the 60 degrees south, which is just right here, is going to be the lower pressure. So 
D is our answer. And one thing that's really helpful for me is if I can cross them out, even if it's just on a piece of scratch paper, that's really helpful for me so that I only see what the actual answers are. Which of the following most accurately describes the direction of winds between 30 degrees north and 60 degrees north? So here we've got 30 degrees north and 60 degrees north. So as you can see here, right below it, we have northeast, and so these are the north ones. They're going north and east. So northeast would be the answer there. So here we have an advertisement, and do make sure that you watch the video that I have in my social studies playlist on political cartoons. So this isn't a cartoon, but it's an advertisement. Political cartoons are something you definitely wanna make sure that you know because most of the tests will likely have a political cartoon. But let's look at this. So spring aftershave. All right, we've got a little bottle there. Survey, survey results show seven out of 10 men prefer spring to other aftershave products. And you look at that and you're like, oh, that sounds great. Maybe I should buy some spring aftershave if I'm a man or buy it for my man, right? This ad attempts to sell spring aftershave by emphasizing its effectiveness. It doesn't really talk about effectiveness, right? Popularity, seven out of 10 men, yes. Its value, no, it doesn't say like, oh, you can buy it for $3, right? Appealing fragrance, it doesn't talk about its fragrance, right? All it talks about is its popularity. Because seven out of 10 men prefer this aftershave, you should buy it too. On the basis of this ad, which of the following conclusions is most reasonable? Okay, so we have some men prefer spring to other aftershave products. Yeah, some do, right? In the survey, seven out of 10 men do, right? But does the survey represent every man? No, it just represents those that, those that they asked, right? So it doesn't mean that all seven out of 10 men, it's just from that, from that survey, right? 70% of all men, again, not all men, just from that survey. Three out of 10 men prefer no aftershave. We don't know what the other three preferred, right? Maybe they chose no aftershave or maybe they chose something else, right? We have no idea. All men use aftershave. It doesn't say that. It gives us no indication. So it's really some men prefer this aftershave over other aftershave, right? just sort of based on what this advertisement said and what their study indicated. This next question is just a standalone question. It doesn't go with any images or pictures or articles, okay? So it's just all by itself. 18, consider the statement below. The worst crime being committed today is the treatment of victims by the court system. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to determine how this statement is classified. Is it an observation? Well, I'm sure that some people are observing it, right? Is it an opinion? Pro probably, right? It's probably an opinion. Is it a fact? Uh, one, quick, one quick tip, most of the things on here, like on your science or social studies tests are not going to be like facts. So when it says, is it a fact, then it probably actually isn't, okay? So it's not a fact. And is it an observation? Uh, probably not. It's, it's really just some, someone's opinion is that. Which of the following questions about a state's budget would be most difficult to answer? Okay, and a state budget is actually a public document. So if you would like to find out what your state or even county budget is, you can easily look it up and see how much, how much different people are making, how much they're putting toward roads or parks or police or rec centers. You can actually look that up, it's kind of cool. All right, let's take a look. So most difficult to answer. Did the state provide enough money for education? Ooh, that word enough is kind of subjective, right? So what does enough mean? It's kind of hard to prove enough, right? Okay, B, did education receive the greatest proportion of the state's budget this year? That will be really easy to tell, right? Because, okay, we can draw a pie chart and this right here is how much education made and education received the greatest proportion, right? That will be very easy to determine. 
Was the amount of money provided for education this year greater than it was for last year? Again, maybe this year they provided $7 billion and next year they provide $7.3 billion, right? That's really easy to tell. How much money did the state provide for education? Again, it's a public document. It's very easy to see. So the answer here is A. It's difficult to answer enough money because it is so subjective. Three of the following statements about the Vietnam War are based on direct evidence. Which statement is based primarily on circumstantial evidence or inference? Okay, so inference is actually something that's on the high set and GED test quite a bit, but not usually in a question. But inference is taking the information that you have, what can you conclude or what, what can you guess, even if it's not directly said, okay? So here we have, in 1968, more than 500,000 American soldiers were in Vietnam. That's very easy to just tell, right? You can just look at the numbers and you can know, right? In 1965, President Johnson ordered U.S. combat units to battle Vietnam and U.S. military involvement ended in 1973. That's not really an inference, right? That's a, that's a fact. C. The lack of military success in Vietnam led to President Johnson's decision not to run for re-election in 1968. I'm sure a lot of people said that, right? So that, can we guess? All right, so here he's president. People were not having success in Vietnam and then he decides not to rerun and that was kind of like his, his big thing that he was doing, right? And it's not working, so maybe he didn't, doesn't rerun, right? But let's look at letter D. President Eisenhower sent military advisors to Vietnam in the 1950s. Yeah, we can tell that. We don't have to infer that, right? So C is the inference. So our next questions here are related to this little chart, okay? So as a part of a report about education in the United States after the Second World War, a journalist concluded the timeline below. So use this to help us answer the questions. Okay, so we've got all these specific dates here. We've got from, it's going from 1940 to 1970, and it looks like 1944 here. Servicemen's Readjustment Act, GI Bill for Rights, provided funds for veterans to continue their education at colleges and technical schools. 1958, National Defense Education Act, provided funds to improve teaching in mathematics, science, and modern languages. 64, Economic Opportunity Act, provided funds for the Head Start program to help prepare children from low-income families to succeed in school. And 65, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, provided funds to help local schools improve the education of children from low-income families. Guys, so many of these are still still in place today. Here's a fun fact. So the GED was started right around the end of World War II, around, around that time. And so it might actually be a part of that uh, Servicemen's Readjustment Act because some men didn't graduate from high school and they went straight off to war and the government's like, oh, we probably need to get these guys educated, right? So they created the GED. And so I bet it was part of that. How exciting. 21. Which of the following titles would best represent the theme of this timeline? Okay. Federal education legislation from 1944 to 1965. Was all of it dealing with education? Yes, it was, right? Let's look at the other ones. B, defense and economic legislation. It didn't really talk about defense or economics, right? C, effects of education on social change. Mm, I was really talking about the legislation, right? D, effects of education on the economy. Again, it's really just focusing on the legislation that took place, so A is our answer. 22, the concern about national security was the most likely motive for the act passed in, so let's just think about it, national security. Does national security have anything to do with the 1944 helping helping the, the GI go to school. Mm, not really, right? 
What about National Defense Education Act? Look at that National Defense right there. It's probably the answer. Okay, let's look at the next one. Ec Economic Act, right? Providing Head Start. No, that doesn't have anything to do with the defense. Let's let's get those preschoolers ready, right? <laughs> uh, 65 Elementary and Secondary Education Act. You know, helping low-income children in high school and elementary. Not really. So the answer is definitely this um, this 1958, the National Defense. Let's educate our young kids so that they are proficient in math, science, and modern languages, so that we can sort of build up our national security. 23. The two acts that seem most concerned with social inequities are those passed in, so it's really, it's really going to be these two, right? Because these ones are all about, it says low-income families right here, and then it says low-income families right here. That would be the social inequities, right? So it would be 1964 and 1965, which is D. The other two don't really have anything to do with social inequities. Which of the following world events was probably the primary reason for the 1958 Act? So again, the 1958 Act was the National Defense Education Act, provided funds to improve teaching mathematics, science, and modern languages. Okay, so the Soviet Union sent troops to Hungary, 1957, Power generated from atomic energy first used in the United States. C, International Atomic Energy Agency established. And D, the Soviet Union launched the world's first artificial satellite. This is going to be the answer here, D, because the United States was like, whoa, the Soviet Union, they're really making some headway right into space and we need to get we need to get our kids educated so that we can we can be up in the race too right 25 consider the two statements below from 1944 to 1965 the only educational programs to receive financial support from the united states government were those for elementary and secondary students b or i guess two <laughs> From 1944 to 1965, the United States government provided more financial support for national security than for education. Okay, which of these statements, if either, does the timeline support? Mm, does it really talk about financial support at all? Like, I mean, it says provide funds, but it, does it indicate anything about financial support or like notice how number one here says only right and it says here um than like more more than right it doesn't really talk about that for either one right it just really talks about this these are some of the legislation that passed through and this is this is what came out of it right so the answer is d we made it to the end guys good job comment below and tell me that you stayed and you watched the entire video because it's a long one these tests are long and it's a commitment and you should be really proud of yourself for watching this entire video now as always believe in yourself you are such an important person and you've got to be like your biggest fan and have positive vibes in your brain growth mindset believing that you can do this because you can no matter what you're starting at in your life what level you're starting at just be purely persistent and get this done believe in yourself just like i believe in you peace friends